On this date, 16th of June, every year, we honour and recall the great and groundbreaking work of 20th century literature that is James Joyce's Ulysses. Ulysses is, of course, Joyce's reimagining of an ancient myth recrafted into a unique work that was not only courageous, but mould-breaking in the way that it would change the path of 20th century literature. We sadly lost, early this year, Stephen Joyce, James Joyce's grandson and his last surviving direct descendant. Stephen, who had a short time earlier become an Irish citizen, was of course the subject of Eke Puer, one of Joyce's most beautiful poems. Stephen's passing has perhaps emboldened us to value even more the wonderful writings themselves of James Joyce, writings that will be his lasting and enduring legacy to humanity. Today, and for our second time in COVID circumstances, we must come together virtually to celebrate Bloomsday. We all have, this past year, been through our own strange odyssey, a journey which has so often challenged us to look at the familiar in new ways, often rediscovering joy and possibilities in unexpected places. It has been a time during which we acknowledged the fundamental role of the arts in our lives, with cultural gatherings bravely continuing to unite us in imaginative and unusual ways. In acknowledging that fundamental role that art and culture play in our lives, we are also, of course, obliged to recognise the profound contribution that those who work in the arts make to our society, a contribution that has not always been given their recognition for its vital contribution to our lives. Our artists and all those who work in the cultural sphere are among those who have suffered most during the coronavirus pandemic. As silence fell across our theatres and galleries, as our concert halls became deserted, the disappearance of such vital workers from the public world became a real and imminent danger. So many amongst our artistic community have fought back courageously, ensuring in many inventive ways that outlets for cultural engagement remained available. In doing so, they have demonstrated the generous breadth of the cultural space and the rich capacity of the arts to unite us in the most challenging of circumstances. As we mark and honour that pioneering work of literature that was Ulysses, let us do so by resolving to seize a golden opportunity to commit to supporting our artistic community, recognising the critical role they have played in creating solidarity during this groundbreaking moment in global history. Teen restrictions have thrown a harsh spotlight on the precarious and uncertain circumstances in which so many of our artists exist, the basic dignity, financial security, or freedom from fear that is the right of all citizens. As we slowly emerge from the coronavirus pandemic and set about the work of rebuilding and recrafting our society, we must enable our creative community to feel their place in that society is respected, is assured. In imagining and realising a post-pandemic future, it is my great hope that it will be one shaped to accommodate and value the arts, the role of culture, acknowledging their necessary and immeasurable contribution to our society. Bloomsday is also, of course, an opportunity to reflect on the rich artistic legacy that continues to profoundly influence our artistic world today. Here at the Aurus, we always remember on the 16th of June, the late Deirdre O'Connell, whose birthday occurs on this day, and who, as founder of the Focus Theatre, played an integral role in the world of Irish theatre. This year, we also remember her fellow founder member and dear friend, Tom Hickey, who sadly died last month. Sabina and I were privileged to have such friends. We remember them both today and the indelible imprint they have left on Irish theatre and on our lives. May I conclude by thanking the talented performers with whom we are sharing this occasion. Brenda McSweeney, Barry McGovern, Margaret Toomey, Noel O'Grady, Evan Gaffney, Clinton Liberty, John Feely and Fran O'Rourke. 
I hope that all will enjoy these presentations by our artists of whom we are so proud and to whom we are most grateful. I wish you all a most enjoyable Bloomsday. Oh, I am thinking of that song, The Lass of Ockram. I am thinking of a person long ago who used to sing that song. It was a person I used to know in Galway when I was living with my grandmother. It was a young boy I used to know named Michael Fury. He used to sing that song, The Lass of Ockram. He was very delicate. I can see him so plainly. Such eyes as he had. Big, dark eyes. And such an expression in them. An expression. I used to go out walking with him when I was in Galway. He's dead now. He died when he was only 17. Isn't it a terrible thing to die as young as that? I was great with him at that time. I think he died for me. It was in the winter, about the beginning of the winter, when I was going to leave Galway and come up here to the convent. And he was ill at the time in his lodgings in Galway and wouldn't be let out. And his people in Orcturard were written to. He was in decline, they said, or something like that. I never knew rightly. Poor fellow. He was very fond of me. And he was such a gentle boy. We used to go out together walking. You know, Gabriel, the way they do in the country. He was going to study singing only for his health. He had a very good voice. Poor Michael Fury. And then when it came time for me to leave Galway and come up here to the convent, he was much worse and I wouldn't be let in see him. So I wrote him a letter saying I was going up to Dublin and would be back in the summer and hoping he'd be better then. Then the night before I left, I was in my grandmother's house in Nuns Island packing up and I heard gravel thrown up against the window. The window was so wet I couldn't see, so I ran downstairs as I was and slipped out the back into the garden. And there was the poor fellow at the end of the garden, shivering. I implored of him to go home at once and told him he would get his death in the rain. But he said, he did not want to live. I can see his eyes as well as well. He was standing at the end of the wall where there is a tree. Yes, he went home. And when I was only a week in the convent, he died, and he was buried in Oaktrard, where his people came from. Oh, the day I heard that, that he was dead. She was fast asleep. Gabriel, 
leaning on his elbow, looked for a few moments unresentfully on her tangled hair and half-open mouth, listening to her deep-drawn breath. So she had that love in her life. A man had died for her sake. It hardly pained him now to think how poor a part he, her husband, had played in her life. His curious eyes rested long upon her face and on her hair. And as he thought of what she must have been then, in that time of her first girlish beauty, a strange, friendly pity for her entered his soul. He did not like to say, even to himself, that her face was no longer beautiful. But he knew that it was no longer the face for which Michael Fury had braved death. The air of the room chilled his shoulders. He stretched himself cautiously along under the sheets and lay down beside his wife. One by one, they were all becoming shades. Better pass boldly into that other world, in the full glory of some passion, than fade and wither dismally with age. He thought of how she, who lay beside him, had locked in her heart for so many years that image of her lover's eyes when he had told her that he did not wish to live. Generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes. He had never felt that way himself towards any woman but he knew that such a feeling must be love. The tears gathered more thickly in his eyes and in the partial darkness, he imagined he saw the form of a young man standing under a dripping tree. Other forms were near. His soul had approached that region where dwell the vast hosts of the dead. He was conscious of, but could not apprehend, their wayward and flickering existence. His own identity was fading out into a grey, impalpable world. The solid world itself which these dead had one time lived and reared in, was dissolving and dwindling. A few light taps on the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly on the bog of Allen, and further westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling too on every part of the lonely churchyard, on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted 
on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. I'm going to read nine short poems. Eight of them are from the collection Poems Penny Each. And finally, an occasional poem, Ecce Puer, which Joyce wrote on the occasion of the death of his father and the birth of his grandson, Stephen. So from Poems Penny Each, or Poems Penny Each, as Joyce spelt it the old English way. Tilly. He travels under a winter sun, urging the cattle along a cold red road, calling to them, a voice they know. He drives his beasts above Cabra. The voice tells them home is warm. They moo and make brute music with their hoofs. He drives them with a flowering branch before him, smoke pluming their foreheads. Boar, bond of the herd, Tonight, stretch full by the fire. I bleed by the back stream for my torn bow. On the beach at Fontana, wind whines and whines the shingle. The crazy pierced eggs groan. A senile sea numbers each single slime silvered stone. From whining wind and colder grey sea, I wrap him warm and touch his trembling fine-boned shoulder and boyish arm. Around us, fear, descending darkness of fear above, and in my heart, how deep, unending ache of love. Simples, O oh, bella bionda, sei come l'onda. Of cool, sweet dew and radiance mild, the moon a web of silence weaves in the still garden where a child gathers the simple salad leaves. A moon dew stars her hanging hair, and moonlight kisses her young brow, and gathering, she sings an air. Faint as the wave is, fair art thou. Be mine, I pray, a waxen ear to shield me from her childish croon, and mine a shielded heart for her who gathers simples of the moon. Flood. Gold brown upon the sated flood, the rock vine clusters lift and sway. Vast wings above the lambent waters brood of sullen day. A waste of waters ruthlessly sways and uplifts its weedy mane, where brooding day stares down upon the sea in dull disdain. Uplift and sway, O golden vine, your clustered fruits to love's full flood, lambent and vast and ruthless as is thine incertitude. Bahnhofstrasse. The eyes that mock me sign the way whereto I pass at eve of day. Grey way whose violet signals are the trysting and the twining star. Ah, star of evil, star of pain. High-hearted youth comes not again, nor old heart's wisdom yet to know the signs that mock me as I go. And finally, Ecce Puer. 
Of the dark past, a child is born. With joy and grief, my heart is torn. Calm in his cradle, the living lies. May love and mercy unclose his eyes. Young life is breathed on the glass. The world that was not comes to pass. A child is sleeping, an old man gone. O oh, father forsaken, forgive your son. Just as the sun was sinking down on the mystic dusk of Bloomsday, the 16th of June, Anno Domine 1904, the three girlfriends were seated together on the strand, enjoying the evening scene and the air that was fresh but not too chilly. Many a time and oft where they want to come there to that favourite nook to have a cosy chat beside the sparkling waves and discuss matters feminine. Sissy Caffrey, Edie Borgman with baby Borgman in the push car, and little Tommy and Jackie Caffrey, two dear little curly-headed twin boys, scarce four years old, dressed in sailor suits with caps to match and the name HMS Bell Oil printed out on both. And Edie Borgman was rocking the baby Borgman to and fro in the push car, while that little fella fairly chuckled with delight. And Sissy Caffrey bent over the baby to tease his fat little plucks and the dainty dimple on his chin. Now, baby, said Sissy, say it out big, big. I want a drink of water. And the baby prattled along merrily after her. I don't the dinky daughter. The third girl, Gertie McDowell, seated near her companions, lost in thought. Wish to goodness they'd take that squall and common and brat of a baby away home out of that and not be getting on her nerves. She gazed out towards the distant sea, just like one of those paintings the man used to do on the pavement with all the lovely coloured chalks. And as she gazed, her heart went, pitter pat, pitter pat, pitter pat. Because, yes, it was at her the strange gentleman was looking. Seated over there on the rock he was, gazing at her intently, his dark eyes burned into hers. Burned into hers. Refuge of sinners, comforter of the afflicted, ora pro nobis, came from the church nearby, and the stained glass windows lighted up the candles, the flowers, the blue banners of the Blessed Virgin Sodality. And Gertie put on her hat, the way she could see the strange gentleman from underneath the brim. And she swung her buckle shoe to and fro, faster, faster, and her breath caught it as she caught the expression in the strange gentleman's eyes. He was eyeing her now as a snake eyes its prey. And in the church, they sang the second verse at the time to Mergo, and Canon O'Hanlon whispered to Father Conroy that one of the candles was about to set the flowers on fire. Oh, look, Sissy, it was little Jackie Caffrey, and they all looked up at the sky over the church. Was it sheet lightning there over the trees beside the church? It was blue and, and then green and, and then purple. It's fireworks, fireworks, Sissy Caffrey said. Come on, Gertie, it's the bizarre fireworks. And they all ran helter-skelter down the darkening strand. But Gertie had no intention of being at their beck and call. If they could run like Rossi, she could sit so she could. So she told them she could see perfectly well from where she was because the look in that man's eyes was making her pulses race. He was still gazing at her. It was darker now, but she could see that he was looking and he was winding his watch and he put his watch back and he put his hand back in his pocket and, and his face and hands were trembling and a tremor ran all over her too. And she had to lean back more to look up at where the fireworks were and she caught her knee in her hand not to fall back looking up. There was no one to see her. No one. Only him. 
And then Jackie Caffrey shouted, look, sissy, look, there's another. Look, look, there it goes. And something queer went flying through the air, a soft thing to and fro dark. And Gertie saw a tall Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up, and in the tense hush, higher, higher, and she had to lean back more to look up after it, high, high, almost out of sight, and, and she knew he could see her, and, and she knew, and, and she didn't care, and, and then a rocket sprang, bang, shot blind, and oh, the Roman candle burst, and it was a sigh of oh, and everyone went oh in raptures, and it gushed out of it. A stream of rain gold hair threads, and they shed and fell, and now it was all dewy, changing, greeny stars. Falling, falling, with lovely dewy, soft and sweet, soft, sweet, soft, sweet. And they all melted away dewily in the grey area, and everything was silent. And she looked at him for the last time. Leopold Bloom, for it is he, stands there with bowed head before those young and guileless eyes. Oh, what a beast he'd been, what a fool. At it again, at it again, at it again. Very slowly, without looking back, Gertie walked down the uneven strand to Sissy, to Edie, to Jackie and Tommy Caffrey, back to little baby Borgman. It was darker now, and there were stones and bits of wood on the sand and slippery seaweed. And Gertie walked with a certain quiet little dignity characteristic of her very slowly and with great care because Gertie McDowell was tight boots? No, she's lame. Mr. Bloom watched her as she limped away. The clue is in the title, Aft in the Stilly Night. The Joyce household were moving again, and of course, they moved mostly at night to avoid the demands of unpaid rent and landlords. Betrayal is very central in Ulysses and in many of Joyce's works. And in this beautiful passage from Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Joyce himself sees himself as the betrayer. When he returns home to find his young siblings after a scanty supper, singing, and he knows that he's about to go for Europe, and as a member of an often dysfunctional family, he thinks his place should be there. But art always came first with Joyce, and I suppose that's why we're here, partly. But as well as being remorseful, he was impressed with his young siblings for them liberating themselves, albeit temporarily, out of their abject misery through song, where they sang in the night and often throughout the night. And from then on, music became the touchstone of his life and his works. When his son Giorgio was born, he cradled him in his arms and sang to him. When Lucia was unwell, he filled the room in Paris with love songs. When his mother was dying, although he didn't pray with her, he sang to her, and she was a lovely singer too. Singing, I suppose, was his form of prayer. And after his exile with Nora in 1904, until he returned in 1909, he was estranged from his father. And when his father met him, he took him by tram to the yellow house in Rathfarnham, brought him over to the piano, 
The father, of course, was a fine tenor, and he could have sang professionally had he the desire and the discipline to do so. Father brought him over to the piano, and there they duetted Di Provenza al Mar il Sol from La Traviata in a scene which involves a prodigal son who has returned. And there at that piano in the yellow house, father and son, in song and in silence, reconciled a particular hurt. Music and his wife Nora sustained James Joyce throughout his turbulent, amazing and roller coaster life. He pushed open the latchless door of the porch and passed through the naked hallway into the kitchen. A group of his brothers and sisters were sitting around the table. Tea was nearly over and only the last of the second water tea remained in the bottoms of the small glass jars and jam pots which did service for teacups. The sad, quiet, grey-blue glow of the dying day came through the window. Covering over and allaying quietly a sudden instinct of remorse in Stephen's heart. All that had been denied them had been freely given to him, the eldest. But the quiet glow of evening showed him, in their eyes, no sign of rancour. The voice of his youngest brother from the farthest end of the fireplace began to sing, oft in the stilly night. One by one the others took up the air until a full choir of voices were singing. He waited for some moments, listening, before he too took up the air with them. Oh, in the stilly night, ere slumber chains hath bound me, fond memory brings the light of other days around me. The smiles, the tears of boyhood years, the words of love then are spoken. The eyes that shone, now dimmed and gone, the cheerful hearts are now broken. Thus in the stilly night, ere slumber chains hath bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me. When I remember all the friends so linked together, I've seen around me fall like leaves in wintry weather. I feel like one who treads along some banquet hall deserted, whose lives are fled, whose garlands dead. And all but he departed. Thus in the stilly night, ere slumber chains hath bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me.
The rain was lovely. Just after my beauty sleep, I thought it was going to get like Gibraltar. My goodness, the heat there before the Levanter came on, <gasps> black as night with the glare of the rocks standing up in it like a big giant compared with their three rock mountain they think is so great with the red sentries here and there and the poplars and they all white hot and the mosquito nets and the smell of the rainwater in those tanks watching the sun all the time weltering down on you faded all that lovely frock father's friend Mrs Stanhope sent me from the Bimash Paris what a shame my dearest Dogarina, she wrote on. What? She was very nice. What's this her other name was? Just a PC to tell you I sent the little present. Have just had a jolly warm bath and feel a very clean dog now. <laughs> Enjoyed it. He'd give anything to be back in jib and hear you sing Inno Madrid or Waiting. Conconi is the name of those exercises. He bought me one of those new, some word I couldn't make out, shawls. Amusing things, but tear for the least thing. Still, I think they're lovely, don't you? We'll always think of the lovely teas we had together. Scrumptious currant scones and raspberry wafers I adore. Well now, dearest dog arena, be sure and write soon. Kind, she left out regards, to your father, also Captain Grove. With love, yours, Affley, Hester. X, 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 X. She didn't look a bit married, just like a girl. He was years older than her. And he was awfully fond of me when he held the wire down with his foot for me to step over at the bullfight at La Linea when that matador Gomez was given the bull's ear. These clothes we have to wear, whoever invented them. Expecting you to walk up Kalini Hill then, for example, all stazed up. You can't do a blessed thing in them in a crowd, run or jump out of the way. That's why I was afraid when that other ferocious old bull began charging the banderieros with their sashes and the two things in their hats. And the brutes of men shouting, bravo, toro, and the women were as bad. In their nice white mantillas, ripping all the whole insides out of those poor horses. Never heard of such thing in all my life. Yes, he used to break his heart at me, taking off the dog barking in Bell Lane. Poor brute, and it's sick. What became of them ever? Well, I suppose they're dead long ago. The two of them. It's like all through a mist. Makes you feel so old. I made the scones, of course. I had everything, all to myself. And then a girl, Hester. We used to compare our hair. Mine was thicker than hers. She showed me how to settle it at the back when I put it up and what's this else? How to make a knot on a thread with the one hand. We were like cousins. What age was I then? The night of the storm, I slept in her bed. She had her arms around me. Then we were fighting in the morning with the pillow. <laughs> what fun. He was watching me whenever he got an opportunity. At the band on the Alameda Esplanade, when I was with father and Captain Grove, I looked up at the church first, then at the windows, then down, and our eyes met. And I felt something go through me like all needles. My eyes were dancing. I remember afterwards I looked at myself in the glass, hardly recognised myself. The change. I had a splendid skin from the sun and the excitement, like a rose. I didn't get a wink of sleep. It wouldn't have been nice on account of her. Well, I could have stopped it in time. <laughs> she gave me the Moonstone to read. That was the first I'd read of Wilkie Collins. East Lynn I read, and The Shadow of Ashley Diat, Mrs Henry Wood. Henry Dunbar by that other woman. I lent him afterwards with a photo of Mulvey in it, so as you'd see I wasn't without. Lord Lytton, Eugene Aram. Molly Bond she gave me by Mrs Hungerford, on account of the name. I don't like books with a molly in them. Mr. James Duffy lived in Chapelizid because he wished to live as far as possible from the city of which he was a citizen, and because he found all the other suburbs of Dublin mean modern and pretentious. He lived in an old sombre house and from his windows he could look into the disused distillery or upwards along the shallow river on which Dublin is built. 
The lofty walls of his uncarpeted room were free from pictures. He had himself bought every article of furniture in the room. A black iron bedstead, an iron washstand, four cane chairs, a clothes rack, a coal scuttle, a fender and irons, and a square table on which lay a double desk. A bookcase had been made in an alcove by means of shelves of white wood. The bed was clothed with white and black scarlet bedclothes, and a black and scarlet rug covered the foot. A little hand mirror hung above the washstand, and during the day a white shaded lamp stood as the sole ornament of the mantelpiece. The books on the white wooden shelves were arranged from below upwards according to bulk. A complete Wordsworth stood at one end of the lower shelf, and a copy of the Maynooth Catechism, sewn into the cloth cover of a notebook, stood at one end of the top shelf. Writing materials were always on the desk. In the desk lay a manuscript translation of Hopman's Michael Cramer, the stage directions of which were written in purple ink, and a little sheaf of papers held together by a brass pin. In these sheets, a sentence was inscribed from time to time, and in an ironical moment, the headline of an advertisement for bile beans had been pasted onto the first sheet. On lifting the lid of the desk, a faint fragrance escaped. The fragrance of new cheddarwood pencils, or of a bottle of gum, or of an overripe apple which might have been left there and forgotten. Mr. Duffy abhorred anything which betokened physical or mental disorder. A medieval doctor would have called him saturnine. His face which carried the entire tale of his years, was of the brown tint of Dublin streets. On his long and rather large head grew dry black hair, and a tawny moustache did not quite cover an unamiable mouth. His cheekbones also gave his face a harsh character, but there was no harshness in the eyes, which, in looking at the world from under their tawny eyebrows, gave the impression of a man ever alert to greet a redeeming instinct in others, but often disappointed. He lived at a little distance from his body, regarding his own acts with doubtful side glasses. He had an odd autobiographical habit which led him to compose in his mind, from time to time, a short sentence about himself containing a subject in the third person and a predicate in the past tense. He never gave alms to beggars and walked firmly carrying a stout hazel. He had been for many years cashier at a private bank in Baggett Street. Every morning he came in from Chapelizid by tram. At midday he went to Dan Burke's and took his lunch a bottle of lager beer and a small trayful of arrowroot biscuits. At four o'clock, he was set free. He dined in an eating house in Georgia Street, where he felt safe from the society of Dublin's gilded youth, and where there was a certain plain honesty in the bill of fare. His evenings were spent either before his landlady's piano or roaming about the outskirts of the city. His liking for Mozart's music brought him sometimes to an opera or a concert. These were the only dissipations of his life. What fragments of verse from the ancient Hebrew and ancient Irish languages were cited with modulations of voice and translation of texts by guest to host and host to guest, by Stephen, shul, shul, shul room, shul go sucker aga shul go kuin, walk, walk, walk your way, walk in safety, walk with care. I would I were on yonder hill, it's there I'd sit and cry my fill. And every tear would turn a mill. Is the jet to Mavurni 
Is good to my in slum. 